Hello, I'm Katina Horton, Bible teacher and the Love and Freedom Toxic Relationship Recovery Coach. And today's topic is entitled, The Masquerade Party of Lying Prophets, False Intentions, and Disguises. When I was a teenager, a young adult, and middle-aged adult, my grandmother and I would watch what she called the stories, okay? And the story was a term, stories rather, was a term that she used to describe the soap operas, okay? And the lineup usually started at about 11 o'clock a.m. with Ryan's Hope, and it would end at about 3 o'clock a.m. with, uh, well, p.m. rather, with a general hospital, okay? And it was our way of bonding, connecting, and breaking the ice with one another, basically, right? And so at least twice a year on each one of these soap operas, there would be some type of masquerade party, right? And at the party, there was always this mysterious man that showed up, right? And he would enter the room and he would work the room by going around and talking to all the other different couples at the party. And although the other uh, couples were happy to see him and they reciprocated in the conversation, from the looks on everybody's faces, you could tell that they were thinking, who is that man? You know what I'm saying? Everybody was wondering, who is this man and who invited him, right? And so before the party was over, and of course, at the end of that particular story, so that you would be on the edge of your seat, uh, you would have to wait until Monday to see what else had happened. Because what would usually happen by the end of that particular story, someone was laid out on the ground or floor, covered in blood. Either they had been stabbed or shot by this mysterious guest that was at the party and who of course took out uh, outside of some side door somewhat, right? And so this person was left on the floor or the ground, bleeding out. And you're left wondering, is this person dead or alive, right? And like I said, it was kind of unsettling because of the fact and uh, mixed in with like anxiety at the same time, what happened to this person? Who was the person behind the mask? And how soon are we going to find out what, what the status is of this individual? Are they going to tell us on Monday? Are they going to wait all the way till next Friday to pick up at this scene? what just happened, right? And so you left you uh, at the edge of your seat, right? But then when you think about it, at one time or another, we have all worn masks, right? And for some of us, we've had a pile of them more, more than one at a time, right? Some of us wear 50 masks a day before we even leave out of our um, apartments or homes, townhomes, wherever we live before we leave out the door, we're putting on about 50 masks, right? To go into the office, to go into ministry, to go to our small groups, to go to church, to interact with other people, right? Even to meet up with people we're dating, right? And so forbid if somebody finds out that we're not perfect, right? That our kids are not perfect, our homes, our cars, our clothes, that we uh, don't have the perfect initials behind our name, Forbid if we walk around being exactly who it is that God created us to be, right? And then we got other individuals who walk around with masks, okay? And they are appearing to be these little lambs. They're lockstep with the rest of the group, right? Like at the masquerade party. On the outside, they look like everybody else, okay? On the inside, they are the wolves in sheep's clothing, and just like the mystery visitor at the masquerade parties, if we're not careful, these wolves will leave us on the ground, bleeding out emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically, socially, intellectually, financially, etc. And in Matthew 7, 15, it tells us, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, okay? 
And in Thomas Keaton's book, that's entitled Fruits and Gifts of the Spirit, he stated, the gift of knowledge also prompts us to let go of our over identification with our group of roles in life. Examples of this are liberally laid out in the gospels where we see Jesus acting to undermine the social presuppositions of people at this time. This was the problem of the Pharisees. They presented themselves as representatives of God when an actual fact, their observance was worldly, right? And for the ring of under-religious guys, the same is what the, all the programs of the people who have a religious God were used to climb the social or political ladders. And like I said, that was from Thomas Keaton's book, Fruits and Gifts of the Spirit. Now, I want to take you to the scene of another masquerade party, okay? And this masquerade party is entitled Old Testament Lying Prophets, Disguises, and False Intentions. And some of these stories we've gone over before, not in the sense of masquerading, right? So we're going to enter door number one. And when you open door number one, you have a man of God and an old prophet. The man of God was commissioned to prophesy against one of the high altars that King Jeroboam set up, okay? And the background story is that King Jeroboam in his idle time, along with the seed of insecurity and rejection, decided that the only way he could keep the Israelite people under his kingship slash followership was to create two golden calves and high places to worship them and appoint voluntary priests instead of the Levites that God commanded, right? And so then the man of God came along and prophesied against one of these altars that were located at Bethel. This angered King Jeroboam, right? And it caused King Jeroboam to want to attack the man, putting his hand out to grab him in the process of him prophesying. So just picture that scene, right? And so God caused uh, King Rehoboam's, King Jeroboam rather, not Rehoboam, but King Jeroboam's hand to wither up. And then he begged and pleaded with the man of God to restore his hand, okay? King Jeroboam gets his hand restored and then he invites the man of God to come back with him to rest at his house and to get a reward. What was the man of God's response? In 1 Kings 13, 8 through 10, it says, And the man of God said unto the king, If thou will give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread, nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. So it seemed like he pretty much had resolved. This is what God said. No eating, no drinking, no returning back the same way, those three things, and he was going to do it, right? That's the way it appears, right? So the man of God, he passed that level one of his testing. And then it just so happened that the old prophet, this old prophet gets a wind of everything that's gone down, right? His two sons let him know everything that's gone down, right? He inquires about the whereabouts of this man of God. Think, this random prophet, right? And they let him know. And when I say they, I'm referring to his two sons, which direction the man of God was headed. And for some reason, in this particular passage of scripture, uh, they've decided that the theme of it would be saddling the donkey, which is a light motif. Whenever we have a theme in scripture, a, a passage of scripture that focuses on one particular theme is called a light motif when you see it repeated over and over. And so this light motif was saddling the donkey. Okay. And so saddling the donkey was something that was usually done uh, as far as authoritative business. Okay. But the only author authoritative business that this old prophet had was taking care of the stealing, killing and destroying on behalf of Satan. There was nothing authoritative about going after this man of God. 
but the man of God did not know this. Okay. So the old prophet, he tries to convince the man of God to come home with him. Now, remember already King Jeroboam tried and failed, right? And so he tried, but the man of God passed level two by telling the prophet the same thing that he told King Jeroboam, right? Okay. And it said, then he said unto him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. Okay. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. Okay. And so now we're entering level three of this testing. Okay. And so the uh, prophet lies to the man of God. Okay. And tells him that the angel of the Lord told him to come back home with him. And I'm going to read the exact uh, scripture verse in first Kings 13, 18. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with thee into thine house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Okay. That's what the scripture says, right? So the man of God does not inquire into this so-called prophecy. He goes home with the old prophet receives a revelation from the Lord through the old prophet, right? About his death. And then he leaves. Okay. They saddled a donkey up for him. He leaves and he is killed by a lion after leaving the old prophet's house. Okay. And then after everything that happened, the old prophet decides to tell his sons to use the burial spot that he had for himself for this man of God. Right. And then he also lets his sons know that, Oh, this must be true, what he had prophesied. Now, I want you to think about this, though. If he didn't believe that what the man of God was saying was true, he would have never gone after him in the first place. So to make the statement like that, to me, would be like neither being here nor there, as they say, so to speak, right? And so what I think is that one of two things either ha uh, happened. Either he was one of the so-called volunteer priests or maybe his sons possibly had something to do with the false worship, but some kind of way he was connected to what was going on or he wouldn't have taken such an interest in it. You see what I'm saying? Either way it goes, the man of God is dead. He's buried and the old prophet's burial space is used to bury him. Right. And then the old prophet tells his sons that he wants, when he dies, he wants his bones place right there inside of the same burial site with the man of God. Okay. And so after all of this has gone down and, uh, King Jeroboam had been warned, right? Remember his hand was withered up when he tried to reach out and grab the, uh, the man of God. Right. So after all of this had gone down and King Jeroboam had been warned at that altar, do you know, he set up, he obviously had to have set up the altars again, because when the man of God prophesied, the whole, all of the ashes fell out, the whole altar broke down. So it said once again, that he once again started worshiping at these high places, right? At those altars. So he had to have erected them again, right? And so um, even though the man of God had prophesied and all of this stuff had happened and he had proof of it, even the death of the man of God, he still continued in his sin, Right. So how is it, though, that, I, that you might ask yourself, how in the world was the man of God fooled the same way that get, we get fooled, right? The man of God was fooled because the old prophet wore two masks and they must have been pretty tight on them. I, I must say that myself. Mask number one was commonality, right? Saying that he had he did the same thing that he did. And then mask number two was hospitality. Both of these masks covered up the old prophet's real motive, which was destruction, stealing, killing, and destroying the man of God at all costs. And so some people will literally come into your life with no intent but to steal and kill and destroy you because of jealousy and your calling. And you wouldn't have even seen it coming, right? 
And so the man of God was fooled mainly because of his toxic empathy. Okay. Whenever someone starts talking about you, about what it is you got in common, whether it's your kids, your home, your occupation, your cars, the grammar school you went to, the colleges, you know what I'm saying? Uh, the neighborhoods you grew in, your culture and ethnicity, and you may you pay more attention to commonality and likenesses and similarities than you do to their energy, your common sense, your gut instinct, and your intuition. You will find yourself just like the man of God and this soap opera character, right? On the road and a donkey and lion standing beside you, right? So now we want to go into, we want to open up door number two. We're still at the masquerade party, right? We have Jeroboam's wife, okay? And so because of the golden calves, the high altars, and gathering up anyone who wanted to volunteer to be priests, okay? And turning the Israelites' heart away from God. God decided he was just going to judge King Jeroboam. It was just like enough is enough, right? So his son gets sick. That's how the judgment is placed on him. And so King Jeroboam had the bright idea of telling his wife, go ahead and disguise yourself and go over to Ahijah, the same prophet who prophesied that I was going to be king over Israel. Go to him and see what he says, okay? And so uh, one thing I want to mention is that Ahijah was losing his eyesight at the time, okay? But guess what? God came to Ahijah and let him know in advance, like Jeroboam's wife is coming to see her, uh, is coming to see you. This is what you need to tell her, right? And so um, King Jeroboam, like I said, and his wife had this plan of deception in order to find out the faith of their son, right? The fate rather. So um, Jeroboam's wife leaves, right? And she enters in and upon hearing the sound of her feet, the prophet Ahijah knew who she was right away. And here is the message that he gave to her. Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thou thyself to be another? So in other words, he's like, why are you pretending to be like somebody else? <laughs> For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. So that word right there, when somebody said they got something heavy for you, you know it's not good. Go tell Jeroboam, thus said the Lord God of Israel. For as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel and rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it thee. And yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do that only which was right in mine eyes, but has done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and has cost me, cast me rather, behind thy back. So in other words, the Lord was telling um, Ahijah to let Jeroboam's wife know, like you ain't had nothing to do with me, <laughs> right? You put me behind your back. You caused these people to sin. You're appointing people that's not even Levites to be priests. You just got a mess going on. You created these golden calves, uh, getting that advice from your team. You're just a hot mess, so to speak. And then it says, he also said this too. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam him that goes against the wall and him that shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away his dung till all be done. Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. For the Lord hath spoken it. Now that sound really nasty, don't it? And you remember who else had that uh, prophecy for them? That was with Jezebel. When they was, <laughs> we was told that the dogs would what? Lick her blood. And that was Elijah's prophecy, right? And so what happened with King Jeroboam's wife, she wore the mask of hospitality, okay? But it was a cover for her finding out the fate of their son, right? And what strikes me as being funny is the fact, here we go, we got a prophet of God, right? All right. And so then it's like, 
what did her and Jeroboam, mainly Jeroboam, because it was his idea, King Jeroboam, did he think that her disguising herself because of uh, the prophet Ahijah's blindness was going to prevent the word of God from going out? Like he was going to think she was somebody else and then prophesy something different to her. It was really childish when you think about it, right? Because God has a way. If you're truly a prophet, you're following him, you're inquiring from him, and you're staying in that space in the presence of the Lord and the Holy Spirit, right? And those fruits are there. God is going to find a way to get that message to you. Whether you lost your vision, lost your hearing, lost your speech, lost your taste, you don't have any hands. I don't care what it is. If you are a prophet of the Lord and that's what you've been called to do, he is going to find a way to get that message to you and for you to get that message to whoever needs to get that message, right? But to think that covering up and pretending like you're someone else is going to change the fate of your child or your situation because of your sin, it's really childish. It goes to show how his uh, his mindset was, you know? And so um, the thing about it is covering us ourselves up in, in the world is not going to stop whatever the consequences are for our sins, right? And it was not going to change the outcome of Jeroboam's son who was sick, right? Sometimes we just forget that God is God. We're going to sin. We're going to be warned. He'll send 20 red flags and we'll ignore them. We'll keep going in the wrong direction until something happens where we're afflicted and there's some air in our lives that we uh, that's afflicted. And then we want to go and approach the people of God to see if we're going to be healed, right? And it's usually when it's too late when we want to go and get a word of the Lord, right? But we don't want to get a word of the Lord when we were sinning, right? And I'm preaching this all to myself as well, right? And so Ahijah was not pulled in by King Jeroboam's wife, which was good. She had been informed by God and probably um, had to be, uh, like I said, he had to have had the relationship with the Lord where God was going to get that message to him regardless of where, uh, what, what, differently uh, able deficiencies he had, right? And so she was in shock, I'm quite sure, from receiving this bad news about their son. As soon as she reached the threshold of their home in Tirza, their son died, right? But he was the only one that was buried because the Lord was pleased with his life, okay? And it says, and all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him. These are the rest of the words of the prophet Ahijah for what he said to King Jeroboam's wife. For he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave because in him there is found some good thing toward the Lord, God of Israel and the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord shall raise him up, a king over Israel who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam that day. But what? Even now. For the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. And he shall root up Israel out of this good land, which he gave to their fathers and shall scatter them beyond the river because they made their groves provoking the Lord to anger. And he shall give up Israel because of the sins of Jeroboam who did sin and who made Israel to sin. Right. And Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Tirzah. And when she came to the threshold of the door, the child died and they buried him. And all Israel mourned for him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by the hand of his servant, Ahijah, the prophet. Now, tomorrow, the masquerade party continues, and I will start up with part two. Remember, you are enough. You can rebuild your family's love story garden, right? Reclaim your power, soul, and identity today. God bless, and until next time.
So 